addicts start from zero. We start negative, mm -hmm. actually. You know, when you're 18, you're at zero. You know, when you've been an addict, you know, your whole life, nobody trusts you. Nobody. Nobody wants to give you any money. Like, nobody really wants to give you a chance. Finding a job. <laughs> yeah, that's hard enough. You know, and then you you just got to keep going, man. People are going to, they're not going to believe in you. Welcome to Chopping It Up, and today we speak with Gabby Turner. So Gabby has five years clean from heroin and cocaine. She talks about an abusive relationship that she was in when she was younger, and this was kind of the basis for her addiction. Um, she also talks about being able to be a functioning crack addict. Um, she's doing very well today with five years clean. She is a social media manager here in the local area. She also studies psychology, which is very interesting. She has a lot of good points on things like that, on how... A woman's mind works when it comes to traumatic experiences. So it's definitely someone great for the ladies to reach out to if you've been through anything like that. Um, so sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy this episode of Chopping It Up. Gabby. What's up? What's going on, man? I mean, here we are. Take two? Take two. <laughs> so, you know, for context, I wasn't going to mention that part, Gabby. <laughs> I was just gonna leave but that why? totally out. I mean, bro. you know, it's cool. Yeah. Shit so happens. the last one we got all of me and none of you, and the camera was upside down. Yeah, major fail on my part. But it started where we're at now. What it did. We're doing it did. Absolutely. Pages. So did. I think it still had its had its purpose. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. So introduce yourself to everybody. Tell us who you are. Why you're here. So my name is Gabby. Um, been in Winchester for about 10 years on and off. I am a recovering addict. Actually hit my five-year mark at the end of this month. Congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. It's been a definite journey to get to where I am today. Uh, I currently own my own business, uh, social media management. I do some website design. I do... Uh, I do pretty much everything. I can help with the business aspect of it. Um, just a whole bunch of different things. Kind of fell into that and found my purpose with that about two years ago and been riding that. Um, I've been an addict for since I was 13. So I had about 25 years in addiction. Uh, that was... What did you like using? Uh, end result. I mean, I've done everything. Like, I dropped my first hit of acid at... 13 years old, um, did my first line of cocaine at 17. And then my, I guess the final hoorah was heroin and crack. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely more the crack. Um, I got caught up in the pill pandemic, uh, when, you know, it was safe to give to everybody. And right. The oxys. <laughs> yeah. That was a whole, you know, Mm -hmm. I was like, there. Yeah. <laughs> you lived through it, you know. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where the whole opiate thing started for me. But yeah, long, long history. And I went down to my absolute lowest, you know, when I was 33 years old and hit my kind of hit my bottom. So where did everything start like for you? Like school? Like, did you have influences in your life when you were young? <sighs> so, yes. Um. I was never a school person. Like I always had a million excuses not to go to school. And my mom was a single mom. And honestly, I think she just didn't want to fight with me. So I would stay home and she would go to work and I would be alone. You know, I was a latchkey kid. I don't know. Do you guys, do you know what a latchkey no, kid is? I do not. So do you remember when your mom would leave and close the door and say, don't open the fucking door for anybody. And you'd see her like, when she got back. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> so that's a latchkey kid. Like, my mom worked, you know. She was a single mom. She was working sometimes. Can't afford to have somebody keep you, so they just left. Yep. It. After age seven, I was left home alone. Like, just to, you know, my mom did what she had to do. Like, she was a wonderful mother, right. but she had to work. She had to take care of business, so. Still taking care of yourself at seven years old isn't easy, right? <sighs> Dude. There's so much I'm unpacking now. You know, I just turned 40, so. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that really wasn't normal. Like, I remember having a conversation with my mom and she was said to me, she was like, you know, when you were four years old, you'd be making my coffee and bringing me breakfast. And I'm like, that's not normal. Right. <laughs> like, right, it's not normal. Right? That is not normal. You know, I have a two, almost three year old grandson and. 
But making breakfast especially. I mean, bring me some coffee. Somebody made the coffee. I mean, maybe, yeah, it. like, you know, but there's... I, yeah. I wouldn't even trust that. Like, they're spilling everything the entire way. Like My daughter liked <laughs> to play waitress when she was little. But it's you're talking about a different level. Yeah, no, this was, like, a different level. Like, my mom would have been sleeping from working, you know, and I was bringing this to her on the weekends, you know. I mean, I remember... I've always been that way. And but to see now the damage that it's done like as an adult and you know the different things I did as a teenager, I'm like okay. All so how do you think sense. those things relate? How do you think like just because you had right to do whatever you wanted, no one stopped you? Pretty much. Um and then I fell in with, you know, when it's just like the kind of the game thing, you know, the family thing when you mm -hmm. really don't have anyone at home and you're alone and you fall in with people who accept you and kind of, you know, bring you into their fold even though they're not good people, they're have their own past, you know, what have you, you attach to them and you start doing whatever they're doing. You know, I was I was 11 years old when I first smart smoked pot, which I mean, I still smoke weed, like, but I don't think weed's a problem. But at 11 years old, like, mm -hmm. that is very much so not what I should have been doing. And it just kind of kept going from there. I moved from Maryland to uh, Alexandria, Virginia when I was about 12. And I f fell in with my stepbrother's friends, and they were doing drugs. And Is this, like, in the city, country? Uh, no, Alexandria, Virginia, the city. Right, and so right outside D.C. I mean, like, literally right over the bridge. So. Big school. Yeah, um, like I said, I dropped my first hit of acid at 13. I met my ex-husband at 13 that I was with for 19 years, and that was a traumatic, abusive, you know, roller coaster ride uh, of a relationship. Had two kids with him and really spent that entire time addicted to drugs in a functional way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would go to work. I was a medical biller. Like, I got my prescriptions from the doctor you know um that gives us a big excuse doesn't it and then, you know even <laughs> even if you're only getting 30 and doing them in 10 days it's still from the doctor it's from the doctor you know you're abusing but it's still from the doctor but and they still use that today like it's a lot harder to get into pain management yes. and you know stuff like that but it's still there and the people still use that as an excuse to this day and i just you know i think back and i'm like man like they knew nothing or how much did they know i think they knew exactly what they were I doing think they knew. have you watched the dope sick or the painkiller oh, yeah. episodes i mean they knew what they were doing they pulled that man in there and paid him off or whatever that happened behind closed doors that got that man to say yes to oxycontin and that just set the world on fire or it set my life on fire <laughs> Well, okay, so to be fair, my life had crashed and burned, you know, a few times uh, before that. Uh, so when I was 20 years old, I moved to Florida uh, for a job with a guy. He was working in cable or some shit, and the, he ended up being a crackhead, like literally. And that was my first introduction to crack, mm -hmm. I went from coke to crack. My daughter stayed up here with my mom, um, you know, bless her. I don't know what I would have done without her. And I lived my life in Florida. Like, I <laughs> did a lot of stuff that I definitely Easy shouldn't. drug use down there, right? It's, like, easier to get it, you feel like. Cocaine? Right. <laughs> Especially cocaine. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know nothing about Florida, but I know no, cocaine is No, I'm going to tell you heavy. right now. I, with the cocaine I got in Florida... I came back up here to visit, and they got some, you know, when I was still using, and they got some. I was like, what is that? Mm -hmm. I'm not using that. You're absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. Been on the bottom of somebody's feet the whole way up here. Uh, all the way up the coast. Yeah. It was yeah. horrible. Um, And then one day, my daughter was, she was about four, almost four. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I literally looked myself in the mirror one day and was like, what are you doing? Like, you have a kid. Like, get your shit together. And I packed up everything, sold what I could, packed up the rest, and moved back to Alexandria, Virginia. Um, got my shit together. What that, year was this? This. So she was four. It would have been 2005. Okay. No. Six. Somewhere around there. I think six. Right. Um, came back up here, or came back to Alexandria. Got a job. Um, and then my neck 
started, which I can't, but there was something wrong with my neck. Okay. So I started having neck pain and it was like, uh, 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 somebody close to me was on med, was on pain meds. Oh, here, 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 take this. You'll feel mm-hmm. better. Here, take this. You'll feel better. Nothing menacing, just wanting to make me feel better. Well, then I went to the doctors and started to learn how to use the medical field. I was actually working in the medical field at the time, so I knew what to say to people. Like, I knew how to get the prescriptions. Like, you know, outside of just being an addict, I had the inside scoop. Like, Mm -hmm. I read, you know, the doctor's reports of when they give people pain medicine and like i knew exactly what to say to them that and the red flags that you had read across too where somebody said this and they yep. red flagged them you're like don't say that yeah no, no don't say that wait 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 right. like you have to let them decide how much they're going to give you don't suggest to them right. anything like you got to let them yeah. make the choice but this right. is what you say like you know so it was a yeah whole... yeah for sure so you was and easily it was easy for you to manipulate the doctors the way you wanted so easy and then and you had legitimate pain to start it starts there most times. And actually, I did have a C3, C4 fusion um, after a year after my second daughter was born, so back in 2008. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was something legitimately wrong with my neck. Um, and uh, I've been you know, better as far as pain-wise since that, but I was hooked. I was on the pills. What like, did they start you out with? Oh, you know, the normal little 5 milligram Percocet. Mm-hmm. Um, I quickly got off of that, though, because, you know, my liver, I mm-hmm. can't be taken <laughs> It's just, it's comical to me, the stuff that I would say, and then literally would just, they would give me whatever I wanted. Uh, and then, you know, it's it, it's crazy, though. It was a five milligram per set with a Tylenol for a long time, and then I was able to get off of that. But my most pills that were given to me wasn't until after I had my neck surgery. This is when pain medicine, pain management became up and coming. Uh, I don't know if you remember. It was like all of yeah, a sudden, absolutely. It's like there's all these pain that's management where the doctors. Pill and... Came from too, and that's where that little chart came from. Is tell them evaluate your pain, and they started, yeah, yeah. So uh, I got into a pain doctor, and he was giving me, oh God, like 120 of the five mil- or five or ten milligram. I think they were ten milligram oxycodons. And then 90 of the Oxycontins, you know, for the long lasting. Mm-hmm. And then here's for the breakthrough pain. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like. Yeah, the time release <sighs> versus the IRs. The IRs kick in immediately. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so it's like, like I'm going to make this right. time release. <laughs> One way or the other, I'm going to make these get me high. That's all you're thinking about. And that's what happens. Like, that's yeah, all exactly. that you do. Um, but I was on the roller coaster. And then I actually used Tramadol to get off get of off pills and this years. was years and years and years later and tramadol is amazing for that too yes. man. for anybody that doesn't know tramadol is an amazing tool to get off of dope yes i don't care if it's cradium or opiates or percocet or dilaudid's or any of those pills man it offsets your withdrawals enough that you can stand it yes it definitely does and it doesn't get you high like i mean i'm sure if you take enough of them i mean anything would get you high it like, hurts your stomach too quickly though. yeah it does I feel like it's It'll gonna make fuck you your stomach yeah. up way before you're gonna get high I, and so, you know, I used that, got off pills, um, and actually left my abusive marriage. Uh, so that was finally over with. Um, I just turned 30. You know, I was, I was young. <laughs> and then I met a guy who he was freshly clean off of heroin. Well, just got out of jail. So when I say fr- I think when you get out of jail, your kind of clean date has to start when you get out. Because mm-hmm. if you were in jail, mm-hmm. it's a lot harder to use you're in a totally different environment you know when you come home and you're bed red smack in the middle of you know access to those drugs you kind of goes both ways depending on if the jail has drugs or not but i agree because i know people that go to jail and get a habit in jail and i know people that go to jail and they can't get anything so they get out and use but so yeah good point it works both ways it does i mean he i mean he was in erj he could (laughs) have Could have got anything. Right, okay. <laughs> like we know what ERJ is. Like what is, is ERJ? Uh, Eastern Regional Jail okay. in Martinsburg. Okay. I spent. I, I had a little. I had a little stay in there. Had a little stint. <laughs> How was that? Um, eye opening. Right. Um, I mean, I was in like a really bad space, but just eye opening to how our prison systems kind of work and the way people are treated and. 
It was it was definitely eye opening. Like right? it was pretty See, bad. It's, it's demoralizing, isn't it? it Strip searches I and mean, all that kind of shit. It, you have to go through even all that. beyond that. You know, beyond that, just we, I remember they didn't give us anything to clean our cells with in ERJ, and it, we would use maxi pads. And when they brought in like the fresh mop water for us to, you know, for you to mop the pot or whatever at night. We would take old shampoo bottles and take the fresh mop water before it had been mopped mm -hmm. and put on the pads and wipe down everything mm -hmm. and like smart. I mean, smart, but we had used that to wipe down the tables we it's ate disgusting. on. Like, that's unacceptable. Like you're wondering about diseases. I mean, and right after I got out of there at one point, they were out of water for like a month. Mm. Like there was something wrong with like their septic system. And I was just Thank God. Yeah, right. <laughs> in there. But no, it was it was horrible. Um so I just What'd you go to jail for? I went to jail for felony distribution and felony to or conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine. Um all right, I guess we're gonna get into this mm -hmm. story time. <laughs> it's, it's consequences, though, man. I think your consequences are, are a no, big part it of is. your story, so, and that's what people need to learn that the, the consequences are what's gonna change it. After I met this guy, we, long story short, fell into drugs really bad. I started using crack. Um, I had tried heroin for the second time in my life, and this time it did exactly what I knew it would do. It got my ass. Um, so we went down the roller coaster of, you know, drug use like mm -hmm. he was interviewing as drug user you know i was not but you know we would run in the streets together like you know it was the whole whole thing well he passed away in june 3rd of 2016 and i was at the hospital with him um my whole world fell apart like at that moment like i was homeless like literally i had a suitcase like it was it was pretty bad well after his funeral and everything um we went back to the streets. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to feel that pain. Like, I was mm. already strung out on drugs. Like, now you're telling me you want me to come off drugs and deal with this mess? Right, right. Wasn't happening. Fuck no. So I went down, you know, the drug spiral. And, of course, everybody in the area knew who I was. They felt bad for me because, you know, I had just lost, you know, the, mm -hmm. who I thought was love of my life. And so they're looking out. Oh, they looked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I mean, you know... I don't know if I could have gone through that point in my life sober at that time. Like, I probably would have totally lost my shit. Like, I'm not even going to lie to you. Um, But so I ended up, I was on a three-day bender and ended up at this guy's hotel room. Literally, all I went there to do was to sleep. Like, shower and sleep. Like I said, I was living out of my car. Three-day bender, dead of summer. You know exactly what, mm -hmm. you know what I smelled like. It was horrible. Went there, took a shower, popped an Ambien. Um, at this point, I wasn't really on dope, but I did dope. Does that make sense? Like mm, You didn't have a habit. Exactly. I wasn't sick from it or anything like that, but I would do it every once in a while if I felt like doing it. This time, I just so happened to feel like doing it. Popped an Ambien, did a line of dope. I was like, okay, I'm ready to come down. I'm going to talk to this idiot until I fall asleep. Like, So we're sitting there talking. All of a sudden, cops are busting the door. Boom. Get on the ground. You know, the whole drill. And they're like, da -da -da -da. I'm like, dude, I don't fucking know anything about this dude. Like, I literally just met him, like, the day before I literally started text messaging. He had drugs. Like. <laughs> right, I don't know him. I just know he's got drugs. That's it. I know nothing about him. So they arrest me and never been to jail before. Like, in my life. Like, I was arrested when I was a juvenile. Like, I'd been in juvenile detention. But, like, my adult life, I had never, besides going to visit people in jail, mm -hmm. never been to jail. So, they take me. And, like I said, I would popped Ambien, did two lines of dope, three-day bender. Got there. Got to the holding cell. Threw some mats on the floor. Grabbed a blanket. And I went the fuck to sleep. <laughs> like, at that point, I think I was in such shock of everything that I was just like, well, right. maybe it's just a bad dream. Let me right, <laughs> just like go Just one thing after the other after the other. Though, Let right? me just go to sleep. Well, I wake up. And, you know, for the magistrate, they're like, yo, mm -hmm. time, da, da 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 I'm like, okay. See if you can get a bond. So I'm like, okay, I have no record. Never been in trouble. Like, nothing. They're gonna PR me. Like, there's no reason for me to be here. I have you no. Think. I have no drugs on me. Like, I have nothing to do with this person. The hotel wasn't in my name. Like, I, 
literally never sold anything, nothing. I have nothing to do with this person. They say a $120,000 bond. What? <laughs> Man, she don't know what they're doing. Me? Right. For me? And then they <laughs> list the charges. And I'm like, max sentence, 15 years. Max sentence, 15 years. Wait. Like, wait, that's 30 years. Mm -hmm. So come to find out. And I had no idea about the story or anything. So they are like, you know, you want to call somebody. I think I dialed the wrong number I'm trying to call my mom. <laughs> I was, dude, when I tell you, you I was hot. Right. Like, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. So they take me to the back. I lay down on the floor. Like, it was horrible. It was like two, three people to, you know, a one man mm -hmm. cell. Like, I mean, it was bad. Threw it on the floor. Went to sleep. Was like, this has to be a bad dream. Hey, <laughs> this just has to be. That's how you feel in that moment too, right? No, like everything is just come at added up, shitty, shitty, shitty. This and is now not we're happening. Here, like, oh my god. Like this is not happening right yeah. now. So I am um, go to sleep, wake up. It was definitely happening. Like I was still in jail. Yeah. <laughs> like, Call, finally, I was, you know, I had enough clarity to remember my mother's phone number called and, you know, my kids are freaking out. You know, they're trying to figure out how to put money on the phone. Like, <laughs> was, I laugh about it now, but it was bad. Like, I feel really bad for my family and, you know, them having to go through that with me and, you know, they couldn't find me. I have like Life 360 on my phone and it was at the jail. And that's really, that's all they knew was I was at the jail. And then the article came out um, about what had happened. And he had like $3,000, like three ounces of Coke. Um, so all this comes out in the local paper? Yeah. And I'm like. Oh, got your little picture there? Got your little oh, mug shot? Oh, yeah. yeah and I was like. Shitty. If you use that as a thumbnail, I swear I'll kill you. <laughs> I probably got one of them somewhere too, man, where it was in the paper. That sucks. Um, And they were serious charges. And they're telling me, they're reading. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? So, you know, my mom's like, I don't got that to bail you out. I didn't think you did. <laughs> like, I already knew I was sitting here. Mm -hmm. They're like, okay, we got seven days till you go to court. Cool. So go to court. You know, sat there for a week, withdrawn. <sighs> Going through it in jail. Bad. Have you ever withdrawn outside of jail? No. So inside. I had never really even withdrawn it like that outside of jail. Right. And then being in jail. Right. And then, mind you, you can't get a month before that, not even losing my fiance. Mm -hmm. Like, when I tell you, I was... <sighs> So all them things are compounded. You can't get comfortable. Your body's hurting. Your brain's going crazy. Like, there's nothing to numb all that. And all you have to do is think about what sucks the most. Yeah, it's, um, never told anyone this, but hey, why not? I actually tried to hang myself in jail. Really? I was that bad. Like, I mean, I was, like, I had to. So what, take me through that. Like, what are you, two, three days in? Yeah, just, that was really about it. And, you know, my family was just being fucking assholes to me. You know, they never experienced, you know, anything like that with me. Like, you know, like I said, I'd always been a problem, but I've never been this big of a fucking problem. And I, uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Like, I just didn't want to do it. So I had, like, you know, like the little block that comes off the wall your little table and your mm -hmm. little chair and i took the sheet and yeah like i was there hmm. but i didn't do it obviously i'm still here you right. know i stopped but i think that was one of my like that was my only real i don't want to do this life anymore moment it's i may have acted like it but you just think it was a combination of everything at everything once on sick top of you. like mm -hmm. i'm going to tell anybody who's experienced you know, dope sickness and, you know, withdrawing and especially in a jail setting and, you know, and then they're promising you these withdrawal drugs that they take fucking three days to even, you know, get you in with meds to get you these drugs. So you're like, 
climate like dude i should you mm-hmm. should have given me this like is there a care package when you mm-hmm. come in the door like you know i'm gonna be sick <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a good point you should have something like that that's like as soon as you come in when they, they could I mean, ask you are you your, on right, drugs and check your urine like just because i tell you something you can still test me a little bit i'll pee for you if you're gonna help me not be sick Most, check and see what's in there i think almost every addict that goes into jail will say yes i'm on dope because they want the withdrawal mm-hmm. meds right. because so withdrawal meds came about in ERJ, um, from what I heard, is because somebody died in there of withdrawals. Mm. And so they were like, oh, oh, we have a big drug problem around here. Maybe we should treat What are they treating withdrawals. it with, you know? <sighs> I feel like one of the only things they ever gave was blood pressure medicine. Yeah, like that was one of them, clonopin, or Clonidine. Not clonopin, clonidine. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, Something else, too. I don't remember what it was. How about no trucks or anything like that? They're not doing suboxone or anything, huh? No, you only got suboxone if you're pregnant. Really? Oh, yeah, pregnant girls got suboxone. Hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I mean, I get it, like, but... Like, what do they... It's just, they treat you horribly. Like, they just, they don't care, basically. You know, you're going crazy in there. And then, you know, I got through that, went to court, ended up getting PR'd. So, you know, really glad. The magistrate said a crazy bond, but the judge said, yeah. just go home. So the judge said, go home, right? I I think they were baiting the hook, you know, but I really didn't know anything. Like, And the magistrate was kind of looking at those charges, thinking you yeah. were facing pretty serious stuff. He didn't want to make a call to some like, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I can see both sides of so that. So they bonded, you know, whatever, got PR'd out. Man, I'll tell you what, I walked out of that jail in some flip flops, some shorts. A wife beater and a bra that I stole from ERJ, a sports bra. Mm-hmm. And I walked. I didn't care what was going on. My phone was dead. I had no, I didn't I'm care. Gone. I didn't have a phone. I'm gone. So I walked, you know, walked to the trap house. It was like, how do I get high? Straight from the jail to getting high. You're damn Were you right. still sick? Yeah. I mean, I was only in there for seven days. Like, so, you know, when you're going through, I was at the end of like the, well, you were high the first two or three, right? Didn't you say? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, you but really only got three or four days there that you're. Yeah, it was not was you know got a half life too that takes that stuff a while to even get the half life out of yeah. you. Yeah, and then that's when I got on Suboxins. Okay. Because where I went to, they, I was like, dude, give me a sub. Like I didn't even really want any dope. Like I mm-hmm. just wanted the Suboxone because that shit was. <laughs> so do you but, stay? How long you stay on Suboxone? I think I was on Suboxone for maybe about a year. Okay. Yeah. How much did you take a day? Oh, I took very, very small Mm -hmm. amounts. Like, I just did it, you know, like I would buy a strip and I would just take it. So you're not getting it from the doctor, you're just getting it from the street? No. I went for the doctor once and then the hassle of it. I'm a drug addict. Like, I don't got time to deal with fucking the hassle of a doctor. Set up an appointment, wait for an hour. I can go to the dope man and just have me a strip in 10 minutes. Like, 20 bucks. Right. (laughs) Right. And and relatively, sometimes it doesn't even cost as much to get it off the street. No, seriously. So, and I mean, it helped me. Like, it got me off. Right. Um, Getting off Suboxone was a, it wasn't difficult for me because I, like I said, I took in such small pieces. Mm-hmm. I was able to break it about. And then I had a friend who had gabapentin and she gave me a couple of those to help me get off the Suboxone. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was, you know, about a year and a half later that I was able to get off that completely. So, but the last one for me was crack. Like that took me a good while to, to kick that habit. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So you like smoking alone? You're smoking with people? Both, but more alone. Right. Um, especially like after, you know, he passed, like that was my, that was my coping, you know, mechanism. But I wasn't like, I was a user of a hundred and thousand percent. Like I had like a $500 day ha- dollar a day habit, but I sold it. So nobody really, like I had a house, I had cars, like I had TVs, there was food in the fridge, like, you know, I wasn't like a normal addict. crackhead. Yeah. <laughs> now, we don't want to be called crackhead, but you're smoking crack and dealing crack. But I you're mean, making, that's what I was. But you're making like, enough to do your thing. Oh, I, I yeah. Label me whatever, dude. I'm a fucking junkie. You know what I mean? People hate to be called a junkie. We were what we were. Yeah, no, I we was. We did what we did. You know what I mean? Hell, I smoke crack. You can label me every drug addict name that you can think of. I've probably been all of them. Oh, no, seriously. Uh, but yeah, so staying 
a head with crack has to be difficult though, because I feel like I've drained my bank account for crack before. Oh, I many times. Well, so when I was running the streets with my late fiance, he taught me how to sell drugs in the area, like in the Martinsburg area. Like that's where I was at. Like he taught me how to do that in that area. So it was like after he passed, a light just flicked on. I was like, well, I want to keep using. Gotta and I literally my worked myself up from like, I remember I first started with a gram and I just kept going back and just doubling up and doubling up and doubling up, and doubling up. And like by the end of it, I was purchasing like an ounce every other day, if not every day from, you know, my plug. And hmm. I never forget, I went to him and money is always right. Like never any. F- like who's the plug, man? Like, is yeah. this somebody that your man hooked you up with or? No. Um. I mean, you're going to say no names or nothing no, like that. No, absolutely not. Like, I would never. But right. I had a knack for finding them. Um, I was a female. Okay. I mean, Makes sense, too. I wasn't, you know, I'm not ugly, like, by any mm-hmm. means. I know how to talk to people, like, mm-hmm. because I have a street education and I've been in the corporate world. So, you know, I know how to talk to people. I know what people want to hear. And then they would see my connections and, you know, the people that I was dealing with. And I became... I don't want to say I became a mule because that's a shitty thing to say, mm-hmm. but I mean, so a drug mule, like, right. you know, that they're like, oh, this bitch, can, I can make some money off of her. Like, you know what I'm saying? She's a runner. Like, you know, she does her thing, blah, 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 blah. And so I just, I was, I don't know. I just had a knack for finding them. Um, but at the end, like the last guy that I dealt with, <laughs> I never forget. I, he was a young boy. Like I went to him and I was like, look, I'm done. I'm out of the game. Like I'm going, I'm detoxing. Like I'm. I'm through. Like, I can't do this anymore. He was like, detoxing off what? Weed? I was like, no, I smoke. He was like, smoke what? I was like, crack. He's like, no fucking way, dude. Like, he didn't believe me, like, at all. Because I'm coming to him every day, every other day, 1600 you know, every single time. There's not a money, a drop long. I'm never asking for a front. Like, none of that. So to him, he's like... It's not what he's used to dealing with. Yeah, so... I mean, you're like in the 1% of crackheads that have money <laughs> at that point. And he's amazed by it. I mean, no, seriously. And I, and no, it's serious. And I'm like, okay. You know, as I've gotten clean, I'm like, I can do that with that. Like, I was able to have that... I don't want to say self-control, because there's many a times that I, you know, smoked mm-hmm. my way out. But then I dealt with people like... This is going to sound so horrible. <laughs> If my two to five hundred dollar a day people ever became twenty dollar a day people, I stopped dealing with them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't. I just I dealt differently. So for me, even if I messed up my money, oh, I knew I could go see so and so, and you know they would give me their money so I could go re up and come back, and I would just you know what I'm saying hit them off and take care of them. So it was always a business to me. But you're, and you now you've moved that over into life now, right? Yeah, and yeah. that's the thing. I've learned that, and that's what I learned out of. And I feel like if I didn't go through that period of my life, I never would have learned that I'm capable of such great things in such shitty times. Mm-hmm. Like you know, now I'm like, okay, I can use this to improve my self discipline. I can use this to you know to do this, do this, like everything where sobriety is has come back full circle to me that I'm like sobriety and you know drug use has taught me this like I now have this discipline like I control my diet now like you know if you control your diet you can pretty much control anything in your life like that's like literally the hardest thing to control and it really just I've used those lessons for sobriety and getting clean and one day at a time and you know, All right, so what do you do daily now to stay clean? Try and stay busy. Um, you know, I found a passion doing what I do with social media and, you know, creating and different things like that. So that helps. Uh, I meditate. Mm-hmm. Meditate's very big for me. Uh, I try to do it twice a day. Uh, How does that work? Once. Like, take us through a meditation. So I follow um, a few different people. Uh, one of my favorite is Dr. Joe Despinenza. 
Um, okay. And he has proven the science behind meditation and like has brain scans and you know all kinds of stuff because i'm not a believe it because somebody told me about it kind of thing like i do want to know the science behind it you know i'm a believer but i'm also a scientific person as well and so he takes you through so i'll put in some headphones uh he has some guided meditations uh like on audible stuff like that um put my headphones in and lay back and just kind of follow through the meditation like go through the breathing techniques and it really helps to get your mind out of your body. Uh, a lot of times, especially even with drug use, our body becomes our mind. You know, we continue to use because our body is craving the substance and right. whatever drug that may be. Uh, you know, for example, opiates. You get sick and withdraw from opiates because your body has stopped naturally producing opiates. It's because you've been taking the drug. So when you stop taking the drug, the body's like, ah, nobody's giving me opiates. And so until that switch turns back on, that faucet, for, you're sick. And that's why it takes so long. You know, even after the, what, 10 days, I would say physically mm -hmm. sick, it's months and months and months before you're able to really regulate that. Like, I don't know about you, but I took a whole lot of ibuprofen and stuff like that when I was first getting clean because everything hurt. Yeah. Like, everything yeah you're definitely sore yeah like it's just sleeping makes you sore <laughs> and that's all you want to do <laughs> yeah yeah and you just want to do it more and more and laying in that jail cell makes it even worse laying on that concrete oh. my hips would hurt so bad sitting in there trying to get clean i was so grateful that when i did like get clean clean i i had a friend and you know she like i because i like i said i had houses you know i had everything and then i just left everything like I literally I moved out of my townhouse like I just left everything there and I took my youngest daughter and we went and stayed with a friend and I was like I want to get clean you know I told her I was like I don't want to do this anymore she was a recovering addict um and yeah she she saved my life man like shout yeah. out to her huh yeah Lee Lee Elliot unfortunately she's not with us anymore um mm -hmm. she passed away and but she was a real great soul she I'm was a wonderful woman. That. Thank you. All right, but uh, yeah, but she I definitely, definitely helped change your life, right? I owe a huge part of my sobriety. So she helped you make her. you comfortable in the house, talked you through it. Like how? What did uh, that support look like? Um, she gave me a place to stay, somebody to laugh with, somebody who knew what I was going through, and didn't judge me. Didn't you know? She just let me go through my shit, like, and I got you know I started working. I got a job at Macy's, uh, worked, God, I was working like 70 hour weeks, if not more. Busy. You, when you're first getting clean, mm -hmm. you have to. Like, you have no choice but to stay busy 24-7. Like, that's the only way you're going to stay clean is to do, have something to do. You have to. Like, I would come home and I would fall in the bed. Like, I would mm -hmm. eat. I would smoke a jacket. <sighs> done. Don't like, give yourself time to think about getting high. Yeah, you can't. Um... And then I was able to take my kids on a cruise. That's what I got them for that Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, my first Christmas clean. I was like, what do I want to get my kids? And I bought them a cruise. And that March, we all went on a cruise together. You know, it was a really, it was a wonderful time. Memorable thing too, huh? Yeah, it was great. We go through so much of addiction doing and, and seeing and being, but we don't remember a lot of it. I have a great dissociative um, disorder. <laughs> right. Don't want to remember it. Uh, I do, though. Like, I'm now that, because, you know, your brain, you remember. You know, the memories are there. Your body remembers, especially, you know, especially when you start learning. I'm, I love psychology. Like, I'm in school for psychology. And you learn about how the body remembers trauma and expresses trauma. And, you know, for example, do you get, if anyone gets, you get agitated, like, at a certain point of the day, like, every day. Like, if you were to sit and think about how you feel at 6 o'clock every single day, you know, most people just don't even pay attention to it. But if you start to pay attention to it, you'll notice your body has certain triggers. Like, for example, my stepfather and I had a really bad relationship when I was young. And every day around 6 o'clock when he would come home... I would get agitated. I would get scared. I would go hide into my room. Like, I just didn't, I felt really bad. 
and it took me to my late 30s to be to learn that my body's still doing it and I was still doing it like I would still at six o'clock I would want to go hide in my room and go watch tv and Mm. you know eat foods and you know do whatever like I didn't want to I would go right back to that 12 year old girl even though I was an adult Hmm. so and it's just the things you learn about how your body remembers and now I'm like I want to remember this stuff so I can move on from it you know I don't know about you but I have horrible flashbacks um, of using like they're not dreams sometimes, but they say that I mean marijuana is supposed to keep you from dreaming, and I smoke marijuana pretty often. Um, but when I do have a dream, it's so vivid and crazy. I just had one the other day that like I was it's just, wow, it feels like I lived it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, some of them I wake up sweating like I've used or I'm trying to get high in my dream and I'm scared to yeah. death of it. So it's kind of the same type of thing. Like you just. Yeah, um, so I also will have, like, flashbacks during the day, like, just going through my regular day. It's getting better, um, okay. but going through my regular day, it'll just, a memory uh-huh. will pop up out of nowhere. It has nothing to do with anything, and you just kind of, you know, it's Cringe. like. Cringe. I, I got some of those, dude. I had oh. one of those this morning, oh. matter of fact. Uh, yeah. And. You know, one thing that I try that I can that I've started and it's crazy that you pointed out because one thing that I've started to separate on those cringe moments are the ones I care about more and the ones I don't. Because sometimes one will hit me and I'll be like, do I really give a shit that they said that? And I just I, I'm learning to blow that off as opposed to some of them that are more important. And you're like, uh, and you can't drop it as easy because, you know, it's more important than something somebody said that's really not relative to what's going on in my everyday life. But some of them might be like, damn, that fucked me up. I'm still thinking about that. That was a long time ago. I mean, I get that. And I just, I've learned you have to go through it. That's with anything. Um, You know, even getting clean, they always offer you this mat, you know, and more, or not morphine. um, Not Suboxone. What's the other one? Methadone. Methadone, Mm -hmm. You know, all that. But you have to go through it at some point. Getting off of all those medications, you know, you're going to have to go through some period of adjustment. Sickness. It's sickness and withdrawal. Like, you have to go through that. And that's with anything. Like, you know, if you quit eating sugar, which I've done, when I tell you I fiend more for sugar. Jesus, Scott just said the same thing. Then I did did heroin ever a day in my life. He said the same thing. He's like, bro, coming off sugar is a motherfucker. Like, so how long does that take, like, before Uh, you start feeling normal? uh, I mean, since I've gotten back, I, you go, it's so hard to avoid, like, huh. sugar completely. Because it's everywhere. It's, every, it's in everything. Right. And it actually lights your brain up more than cocaine. Like, there's been scientific studies about this, that sugar will so ignite your brain up higher than cocaine will any day. Mm-hmm. Fast food, all that crap. Yeah, it's horrible. So, uh, also, because I, I also think the same thing. I think that, like, methadone is the box, and your uh, end goal should want to be to be off of everything. I've known people that are on methadone for friggin' 25 years now. And if that's what's keeping them going and you're not messing up because of that, I'm all for it. But I think your goal should be to be off of everything. Because methadone made me gain weight. It numbed my emotions. It made me feel a way that I didn't want to feel. It made me very lethargic. Um, so for me, personally, it made me feel into a different person, just like the other dope did. But uh, we are talking a little bit about the withdrawals that you go through, too. Like, cause you know, we talked about coming down on tramadol, like you can do them little step downs mm-hmm. and they can be super helpful as long as you don't get addicted to the next substance. And that's the, you know, like you were talking about like with the flashbacks and stuff, you have to go through it. Mm-hmm. And it, technically Suboxone, methadone, you're only supposed to be on that for like seven days. Like that was the original plan for the treatment with these mat drugs is to get people into these detoxes for Seven days, they'd give you a really high treatment because, you know, Suboxone and Methadone both bind to your opiate receptors. Mm-hmm. So they stay there for a very long time. So you start with a high dose of treatment. And over that seven days, you start to step down, but it's still bound to your receptors. So over the remaining course of the seven days or 14 days, you would slowly come down off of those other drugs as it, you know, released from your receptors and so forth. But then they started to figure out that they could make a lot of money off of it. Um, and clinics started popping up everywhere. And doctors are writing them out like they're candy, just like they did with Percocets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 
government's paying for it. Yeah, and I'm not against it. Like, I don't want people to think, I'm not against it at all. Like, I didn't go to rehab when I got clean. I'm not against rehab. I'm for rehab. If rehab helps you and helps you get through whatever you need to get through to get clean, do it. AA programs, you know, whatever works for you, do that to get where you need to get to. But there is life on the other side. Like, you know, you're, don't let them trap you with the Suboxone and with the methadone and because they're going to keep giving it to you until you say, I don't want to live this life anymore. They're going to keep giving it to you. They will. And that's just because it makes money. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. You know, I'm, I listen to a lot of audio books, you know, like Doing the Dishes and, you know, stuff like that. Audible's the best, dude. You want to learn something. You There's so many free books on there. Like, even YouTube has plenty of free uh, audio books. Like, I, that helped me get clean, too, was just learning. Listen to educational stuff. And they were, I was listening, and he's talking about, like, persuasiveness, because I do marketing, you know, what have you. And he's like, the difference between a market value and a social value and when you apply um, so um, let me explain what those two are so a market value is a price anything monetary is a market value a social value is you scratch my back i scratch yours it's a bartering system it's a your mother-in-law and this is the exact example that he uses in the book your mother-in-law would be pretty upset if you offered to pay her for cooking thanksgiving dinner but she would probably be okay if you just gave her a bottle of wine and said thank you because you know one is a market value which is the money and then the other one is just kind of a social okay gotcha. thank you you know and uh, that's really what's kind of happened with a lot of things is everything has been placed on a market value. Like everything's been given a price to it, you know, whether it be rehab, whether it be therapy, whether, you know, drugs, it all has a market value. Like there's no more society. Just let's take mm -hmm. care of each other. Well, once we, once we monetized prisons and jails and we monetized uh, being a doctor to the extent that we have, that you can be a millionaire doctor, like, we monetize healthcare, and that's right. when people stop being, you know, good doctor. I mean, there's still good doctors sure. out there, but I've worked for doctors. I know what they have to go through to keep their head above water, and it's pretty messed up what they got to go through to do that. Like, you can't see 50 patients in a day and tell me that you're giving every single one of them exceptional health care. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's not, and they struggle and they they mess and up. it costs them a, a small fortune just to be in business by the time you're talking about you know the insurances and things like that that they pay and their staff right. hospital so then dues. when they started turning that around and they start making it into hey we're the government we'll pay for you to be on suboxone or we'll pay for you to be on Th this program or, yeah and I, you know, I've talked to people before that have gotten a, let's just say, for example, they're getting welfare, they're getting a little check, they're getting their stamps, whatever. And then they find a little side job and they only want to work under the level of what they can keep their benefits. You know what I mean? So if they're getting that free money, they want to keep that free money coming in. I'm not going to work over the 19 hours a week or whatever it is I can work because I want my free money more than I want to work for my money. So we're taking drug addicts and we're saying, here, I'm going to pay for your dope. And the only way they're going to stop paying for your dope is if you start making enough money that they don't have to pay for your dope. And I just feel like that's continuing that circle a little bit, isn't it? Yes, it's helping, but you're like, the government's buying your drugs, bro. Who's ever going to quit? So my theory on that is keeping people in their place. Um, you're keeping – so the um, original program for, like, Section 8, HUD housing, food stamps, TANF, you know, all the government assistance programs were built for you to be able to supposedly like this is their, you know, their line mm -hmm. to be able to rebuild your life from there. But they don't tell people how to do that. They just give them all of these free resources, you know, food stamps, free rent, free, you know, pills, you know, whatever the case. I was on Medicaid when I was a drug addict. They were paying for it. Like, I never paid a copay to go see a pain doctor or to fill a pain prescription hmm. or nothing. It was paid for. I, so that's back to the barter system you were talking about earlier. One back scratches the other, right? Big pharma scratches government. Government scratches big pharma. Like Exactly. Like, it's just going back and forth. And 
<laughs> it's ridiculous though, man, when you sit and think about it that way, that, that that's how it works. Like the government's like, here, I'm going to help you prescribe more pills by paying for it. I, it's, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to really make a, a you know, but I still have my opinion. I feel like it's a little bit much. No, and it, it has come way down. It has. But, but because the government, because now people are like, we have a problem, you know, but the government, they got away with it for as long as they want, could. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, they're still getting away it. with it. You know, yeah, they're still getting away with it. Like, you know, so, but they don't tell people when they enter in these programs that there is actually a path and a plan you're supposed to follow. So HUD housing, for example. Most people don't know this, and I hope whoever watches this video, this helps you, and you can go to the right, find your right resources. HUD housing was actually built for you to become a homeowner. HUD housing will pay for your mortgage if you decide to buy a house while under their program, the same that they will for Section 8. They will help you purchase a home, but they don't tell them this. So I know somebody who got into the program 18 years old. Her youngest daughter just turned 18. Her oldest daughter is, I don't know, 24, 25, something like that. So basically the past like 25 years she's been in this program. And she's exiting it the exact same way that she left it or that she came into it. Nothing. Because nobody told her, hey, let me help you get to this different place. Like, let me help you use this program. So they would, they do pay her for her rent the whole time that she's lived there, but they never let her own anything. Yeah, but never loaned anything. No social worker ever came to her and said, hey, let's get you out of this system. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, let's, Mm -hmm. and I mean, she's had her struggle, you know, struggles. Everybody has, but I just feel like these programs aren't utilized properly. They're utilized to keep people down. Like they want to keep people where they are kept citizens isn't mm-hmm. that the word that they use mm-hmm. and you know everyone always asks me why i never got on it like i never i've never had section eight only thing i ever had was medicaid and maybe food stamps here and there when i needed them i mean like, i'm like man i don't want them to pay my bills like i'm okay like i'm not okay because <laughs> it's rough out here but i would never like it was yeah, just me i don't think i've ever used it either but i always found a way to hustle yeah i always found a way to make my money up and you know and people mm-hmm. need the pro- they need these programs like these programs are you know we you just did the video about your the speed bumps right it's ridiculous we put in literally how 30 speed bumps why couldn't we invest that in programs for people and you know transitional housing uh you know educational programs Mm -hmm. like there's so much more that that could have gone and there's another thing that there's another side of that too so i'm pretty sure that those same crosswalks i was standing at they used to have a guard that would stand there Mm -hmm. stop sign guard okay i remember those. i I don't i don't know if they still have the stop sign guard or not maybe they added the speed bump and the stop sign guard but if those speed bumps took out the stop sign guard you just killed a job with them i don't know if it did or not but no, they, they put, they put them everywhere. Like, yeah, everywhere. All, they're all the way, but they're yeah. near all the schools. Yeah. If you pay attention, they're near the schools most of all. I think they're supposed to be crosswalks for children. And I'm all about protecting kids, bro. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I'm also about not tearing my fucking car up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because I've jumped them things and had shit come up out of the back. <laughs> now, maybe I was speeding. Maybe that's the fucking maybe point. Maybe that's the reason you know for saying? it. <laughs> maybe that's the point, dude. Maybe we're missing the whole point. But at least some little bumpy things could work better to thump, thump, thump so that you would know something's coming up before you, you know, generally your car. Yeah. You know, over top of Roscoe. Yeah. For I anybody mean, that knows now, anything about Oh, um, I don't know if you noticed that, you know, July is when all the new laws come into effect in like Virginia, like every year it's in July. Okay. Virginia is now allowed to use speed cameras at traffic lights. Well, they definitely pass it in the school zones. They've been doing that for a while. But yeah, nope. They now can use it in the uh, traffic lights, uh, like a busy intersection, a high risk intersection. I'm like... Mm. Well, what's high uh, that's probably beneficial in a couple of ways. You know, you can find out who really ran a red light. You can see what really happened. Uh, but if they're just going to be clicking tickets off for you running red lights, like rolling through a red light, then I'm absolutely against all of that. <laughs> I definitely roll through. Oh, you, I mean, you don't drive in Maryland often. Hmm. Maryland's horrible. So uh, I don't know if we, you want to get into some of these other questions or. Um, yeah, you want to ask them? Let's go. Yeah, let me see which ones I got here. 
So these are like, I mean, I guess I can say design because I designed them and I'm awesome. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's like uh, uh, added questions, you know. You can pass if you want to. Um, can you describe how your jug of choice made you feel? <sighs> Nothing. I I didn't feel I felt I felt nothing which made me feel in control because I didn't feel anything you know coming getting clean the hardest part is dealing with your emotions learning to feel your emotions again like I don't know about you but I was an absolute wreck my first probably about two years <laughs> but when I used I, I felt nothing like I didn't care Right. And that was so much easier. Than Selfish. Yeah, it was so much easier. Mm -hmm. Like, it, but it, I mean, it, it wasn't obviously, but because we all know, it, but it was just. Right. Well, I know that emotional rush that you're talking about too, though, because that comes and you're like, oh my God, I did this, I did that. People are telling you things that you did you can't remember. Yeah. It hits different. It's hard. And, you know, you're actually feeling it. It's not like you're high and somebody's telling you, you're like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you know, you try to act like the big man about it, you know, but no, I felt, I mean, I felt nothing. Like, you know, you'd get that, that initial, like, rush, and then, you know, you'd be chasing that pretty much all day. Like, that's literally how you spent your day. And, yeah. you know, eventually you'd go to sleep and you'd start all over again. And it was just that. It was just the nothing. <laughs> Numb. Hmm. What was the lowest point? Of active addiction for you. Oh man, I had a few of those. Um, I think my lowest point was definitely when I went to jail. No, 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 that wasn't. So lowest point was uh the last. So I got all the charges dropped. You know that I'd mentioned earlier. Um, because I literally just had nothing to do with it. So I just, anyways. And we never did give that conclusion either, did we? <laughs> we really didn't. No. We just kind of glazed right over the jail thing. How was jail? Jail sucked. Okay, moving on. We never even know what happened to your sentencing. Sorry. Um, I got off. All the charges were dismissed okay. um, because I just didn't. They, I literally was just there. Mm -hmm. So everything ended up being dismissed, which I was grateful for. Um, I, and that took two years. So that took a while. Um, I literally just got my letter like emailed to me that you know charges were dismissed i was free and clear blah 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 blah. and i get pulled over and like i had like some pills in my purse and i had a pipe um I had some crack on me but like i stuffed that down my pants like immediately get pulled over and i didn't even know i was getting pulled over for i was like i'm not speeding like come on now like i i know better mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and uh, the cop was like, well, I'm pulling you over for your tents. I was like, oh, well, this isn't even my car because it legitly was not my vehicle. And he's like, but I'm more concerned about, you know, why you have your purse in the backseat, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, when I pulled you over, you got your stuff out of it and then you put your purse in the backseat. I'm like, yeah, you, you need my license, you know, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, so... Long story short, he ended up pulling me off the car, out of the car. I was sitting on the side of 81 in handcuffs. Um, ended up being a legal search and seizure kind of thing. Uh, but that was my, that was, I can't do this anymore. Like, I just can't. That was my lowest. Like, that was the last time I was arrested. I got clean right after that. Hmm, they didn't find any drugs or anything on you? So they found the pills. They found um, my pipe. Uh, and I wasn't arrested that day. Like, I had the sheriff come out there. I mean, I had the supervisor come out there because, like, how the cop treated me. Like, I mean, there was literally... The cop was really more worried about me putting my seat, my purse in the back seat, than the knife that was on my hip. Hmm. And I'm like should be a little bit more concerned mm. for your, you know, I would think for your safety as opposed to, you know, anyways. Right. So they found that. And then I ended up going home and smoked the rest of my crack I had. Why not? <laughs> and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I, 
like, I just can't do this anymore. And they called me a couple of days later and they issued a warrant and I had to go in and turn myself in. And this was here in Winchester. And then I ended up getting PR'd right away because Virginia doesn't play that. They're like, well, I'm not going to process you back in here for what? You literally have no record. You can't. I literally walked into the jail and turned myself in. So mm-hmm. I was PR'd. Um, and it was right then. I was like, I'm, I don't. I don't want I'm this done. life anymore. It's over. Yeah, like, it's over. Like, this is where I'm going to be. Like, I'm not, I don't want to be in jail. Like, I don't, it wasn't what I wanted to be. That was my, that was my lowest, man. And then so I you just, start building disgust, too. Yeah, you like. Just disgust it with everything you've been doing. <sighs> I think it takes disgust to quit. It does. No, it really does. So, in your opinion for addicts, like, you got some people that look at people that are addicted, and they're like, just quit using. Just put down the needle, put down the pipe, stop. Why can't you just stop? In your opinion, why why is that that people can't just quit? For those people that think that way, um, for people who think, why can't they just stop? All right. I don't want you to have your cup of coffee tomorrow morning. You can't have it. You can't get up and get in the shower and walk to the coffee pot and have your cup of coffee, read the paper, whatever. All right. Doing Fill in morning. the blank. You can't do any of that. Like, I just want you to sit. You can't do any of that once you sit right there in your bed until it's time for you to get up and to go to work. What are you going to do? You're going to freak out, right? Your body's going to freak out. Like, you don't have caffeine. Like, I need a shower. Like, for an addict, that's what quitting is like. For telling us something that we can do every day that you can't do that anymore. Why can't you do that anymore? And it's not because something's wrong with us. It's because of how the brain works. And I want people to know it's not your fault. Like, we're all addicted to our habits and our repetitive motion. Like, when you were using, you could literally probably still tell me what you did every day. Right? Sure. Similar to your morning routine now. Well, your morning routine's healthy Mm -hmm. now. But, correct? Yeah, sure. I had the same routine. And... That's why we can't quit because humans are built on routine. And until we're ready to change that and we make a really big, you know, commitment to that, it just won't happen. Like I always say, you want to sit next to the most kind, understanding person, like sit next to a recovering addict. Like we've been judged by our families, by the entire world. And most people will just sit with you, dude. Yeah, some people. You got to deal with your insides when you quit, when you quit using, right? Because you started using for a reason. If you just quit using, doesn't mean, you know, taking the medicine out of there is going to make you okay. You weren't right before you started. Is. That's exactly what we just hit on about, you know, the Suboxone and, you know, everything that they give people. They don't ever have to heal their insides on mm-hmm. that. You know, it's like alcohol, how alcohol is so accepted and widely used and, you know, that's okay, but, but it doesn't solve anything. You know, keeping them on the respectable, you know, perks that used to be a respectable mm-hmm. <laughs> drug. But, you know, now that they're on everything else, they're kind of, they don't have to heal that part of them because they don't provide therapy. You know, you just go to the doctor and get your prescription. And yeah. So if Gabby had a mission statement, what would your mission statement be? I just want to help other people get out, man. I I don't know if I have a mission statement, but there's life on the other side. I just want to help. That's it. I just want people to know that it's great over here. It's hard. It's it's a journey, but it's definitely worth it. And it's not easy. No. It's not going to be easy. There's no pill you can take. There's no switch you can flip. It just, it doesn't happen. You know, the the medicines and stuff will help you get off. The therapy will help you through. Um, However, whatever therapy you choose to do, whether it be YouTube therapy, what I did, Mm -hmm. you know, or you go see a therapist, you got to work, like you said, on those insides. Be active in it, though, right? Yes. Yeah, you have to be active. You have to have a plan. This is what I'm going to be doing. This is how I'm going to combat this. If I do this, this is what I'm going to do instead. (laughs) You have to be active. Yep. And you know, don't <coughs> don't beat yourself up, like. And I think that's the hardest part about being, you know, addicts start from zero, 
we start negative, mm -hmm. actually. You know, when you're 18, you're at zero. You know, when you've been an addict, you know, your whole life, nobody trusts you. Nobody. Nobody wants to give you any money. Like, nobody really wants to give you a chance. Finding a job. <sighs> yeah, that's hard enough. You know, and then you you just got to keep going, man. People are going to, they're not going to believe in you. They're going to, you know, I used to, my parents would start, you know, bring up the past and, you know, beat me up and, you know, what have you. I'd be like, I don't know who you're talking about, but that person doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And then you're not helping. No. You're not helping by throwing that shit back up in our faces, man. That's not, not going to help bit. anything. Well, remember when you, yeah, I, I don't have anybody that does that in my life. And I, not if anymore. I did, they wouldn't be around me. I, I've cut off everybody. Right. Like my or I family, would tell them, like, yo, don't do that. Yeah. It was bad. Like, I cut off my family, cut off my kids when I was getting clean because of the way they were speaking to me. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't productive. Mm -hmm. It's guilt-based instead of support-based. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, not it was, good for anybody. It was horrible. I'm like, mm -hmm. man, I'm not going to even deal with you. Right. And I guess that's, like, another thing I want people to learn from this, too. For the people that don't use and you're trying to support somebody, don't do it that way. Don't make them feel bad about what they did. Of course, they need consequences. They need to understand that what they did was wrong. But if they're starting to get clean, Jesus Christ, help them. Don't hurt them. Don't tell them that all they did so that they're like, well, fuck it. They're not going to help me anyways. Let me go get high. If you're supporting them, they're going to see the, the you know that there's good in that and they're going to keep chasing it. And there's a difference between a support and enabled. Like, you know, sure. you're supporting somebody, you're giving them encouraging words, you know, you're telling them that they're doing well, you know, you're there for a shoulder to cry on when they just need to, like, release and cry about something. That doesn't mean you're supporting them, you're giving them money, or you're, you know, paving the way for them. Mm -hmm. No, they need to figure that out for mm -hmm. themselves, because that's part of getting clean, mm -hmm. and you just gotta do it. It's hard to do. It is. It's hard to do, especially for parents. Oh, I yeah. think that's where the hardest, I see the parents fail the most out of when they're seeing their kids go through it and they just want to give, give, give because they think that's going to help. We have to do it ourselves. We have to fight. If you're not going to get up and fight for your own fucking life, why should anybody else? And I think addicts are chosen warriors. The ones that made it out, dude, there's nothing we can't survive. There's nothing we can't get through. Like, you know, and we're, we're like firemen. We're trained to reach back and, you know, help other people to get to where they're supposed to be, even mm -hmm. if it's just an encouraging word or, you know, having podcasts like mm -hmm. this, you know, helping out your community. But even if just being there for that friend that's not drinking and getting them to do stuff that's not alcohol. Sometimes related, it's super you know? simple. It's something I got I got guys on my Facebook page that are posting stuff about been clean this, been doing that, whatever. Dude, a like and a hell yeah. Congratulations. How and hard is that? It's fucking free. Just go in there and tell them you're proud of them. Like, yep. go in there and give them a little something, man. For sure. Best thing that ever happened to me was when my parents cut me off and I had to rebuild my whole life. Yeah. And I got, I got a 45 or 47 year old friend right now that they've never cut him off and the government plays for his dope. And uh, he, He's gets very comfortable, a, he gets a he? ride from his dad every day to go to the dopamine clinic, you know, to go to the clinic and get his stuff. And then the rest of his day is spent doing nothing, no work, no nothing, just. You know, and I, I just root for him every day. I want him to, but you can't talk to some people, man. So anyways, let's close out. What else do you want to say? Anything else you want to drop before we go? You know, a couple of, I know you got an Instagram page, things like that. We want um, to drop some yeah. links. Uh, yeah, I got Instagram page, uh, underscore Gabby T underscore, uh, give, you know, advice, help kind of people connect with each other and get through stuff. Um, on Facebook, Gabby Turner. And yeah, that's. That's about it. You need social media stuff, hit me up. <laughs> right, so same thing for the social media stuff. They hit you through Facebook or Instagram yep. be the way to message you. Yep, that would be perfectly fine. Okay. And, and we'll put all that under here. I'm sure Jamie's a yeah, rock yeah. star. <laughs> we'll, we'll get something done there if I've learned how to actually paste them correctly. <laughs> Because I've pasted a few and I haven't looked at them. So, yeah. But we'll figure it out. And your name's going to be in the title either way. Yep. Outstanding. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, man. I appreciate you coming by. I mean, it took twice, but. We got okay. it done. <laughs> so y'all know what to do, man. Like, subscribe, share, do all those things that uh, help this little tiny channel out. Growing and, uh, every day. Absolutely. Every day a little bit more. And don't forget to uh, don't sweat the petty things. Pet the sweaty things.